Imagine, if you will, a land bathed in the golden light of dawn, where monolithic giants pierce the heavens, their smooth granite flanks whispering tales of ancient kings and forgotten empires. This is not a scene from a fantastical novel, but the very real legacy of an ancient kingdom once upon a time in Africa, the Kingdom of Aksum. Once a beacon of power and prosperity in the ancient world, the Kingdom of Aksum was a civilization that thrived in the Horn of Africa from the 1st to the 8th centuries AD. In this crucible of history, where trade routes converged and empires clashed, architectural marvels arose, defying both nature and time. The Aksumites left behind a legacy of wonders that still captivates and inspires us today. Welcome to yet another eye-opening video segment. In this video, we are exploring the technological marvels and wonders of one of the glorious kingdoms of the ancient world, rooted in Africa, the Kingdom of Aksum. Before we continue, don't forget to kindly usher us some support by hitting the like button of this video. Share with your families and friends to keep spreading these eye-opening informative contents that we put out before you, and kindly subscribe to aid in building the rising membership of this channel. Every inch of support ushered means a whole lot to us. Aksum's story begins around 100 BC, a crossroads where civilizations collided. Egyptian pharaohs sought the fabled incense of Arabia, Roman merchants craved exotic spices, and Indian traders bartered silks and treasures. This confluence birthed a kingdom unlike any other, a fusion of African tradition and cosmopolitan influences. Its wealth fueled an architectural revolution, a symphony of stone and wood that echoed through the ages. This major empire of the ancient world, the Kingdom of Aksum, arose in Ethiopia during the first century CE. Aksum was previously thought to have been founded by Sabaeans, an ancient people speaking an old South Arabian language who lived in what is today Yemen in the southwest of the Arabian Peninsula. However, most scholars now agree that prior to the arrival of Sabaeans, an African settlement by the Agar people and other Ethiopian groups had already existed in the territory. Sabaean influence is now thought to have been minor, limited to a few localities, and disappearing after a few decades or a century, perhaps representing a trading or military colony. This wealthy African civilization thrived for centuries, controlling a large territorial state and access to vast trade routes linking the Roman Empire to the Middle East and India. Aksum, the capital city, was a metropolis with a peak population as high as 20,000. Aksum was also noteworthy for its elaborate monuments and written script, as well as for introducing the Christian religion to the rest of sub-Saharan Africa. The Kingdom of Aksum was situated in the highlands of northern Ethiopia, in a region called Tigray, near present-day Eritrea. Humans had inhabited the region and the valleys below since the Stone Age, and agrarian communities had been there for at least a millennium. But the origins of the Kingdom of Aksum are mysterious. People from the Kingdom of Saba, across the Red Sea on the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, may have migrated into the area in the first millennium BCE and influenced its culture. In this region, archaeologists have found evidence of a complex society called Diamat, or DMT, that preceded the rise of Aksum by several centuries. This culture was apparently based in the village of Yeha, in the Tigray Highlands about 50 kilometers, that is, 31 miles, northeast of Aksum. Another city-state seems to have existed right next to Aksum on the Bieta Georgis Hill. Scientists and historians are still trying to understand the process of cultural and economic development that led to the growth of a wide polity in this region. Nevertheless, it is clear that by the 1st century CE or thereabouts, Aksum had emerged as a state to unify the area. The local geography contributed to the rise of Aksum. The city is located some 2,000 meters, that is 6,562 feet above sea level, on a plateau. Its climate, rainfall patterns and fertile soil made the area suitable for herding livestock and agriculture. Most importantly, the city was strategically positioned at the crossroads of trade routes running in every direction, from the East African coast to the continent's interior. The Aksumites took full advantage of these commercial opportunities. Gold and ivory were perhaps their most valuable export commodities, but they also trafficked in tortoise shells, rhinoceros horns, frankincense, myrrh, emerald, salt, live animals, and enslaved people. In exchange, they imported textiles, iron, steel, weapons, glassware, jewelry, spices, olive oil, and wine. Their trading partners included most of the major states in the known world, Egypt, South Arabia, the Middle East, India, and China. Perhaps their most important commercial partners were the Byzantine Romans. 
Aksum developed a civilization and empire whose influence, at its height in the 4th and 5th centuries CE, extended throughout the regions lying south of the Roman Empire, from the fringes of the Sahara in the west, across the Red Sea to the inner Arabian desert in the east. Despite its power and reputation, it was described by a Persian writer as one of the four greatest powers in the world at the time. Aksum was the first African country to mint its own coins, in gold, silver and bronze, all in the standard weight categories issued by the Roman Empire. These coins have been recovered in multiple foreign locations, including as far away as India. The Kingdom of Aksum reached its peak power between the 3rd and 6th centuries CE. In those years it was a prosperous stratified society, with divisions ranging from high nobles, lower status members of the elite classes, and common folk. The Kingdom of Aksum is notable for a number of achievements and architectural marvels such as 1. Obelisks of Aksum Step into a world where obelisks taller than Roman monuments stand sentinel over the ancient city of Aksum. The obelisks stand as the undisputed crown jewels of Aksum. Towering over the ancient city, these monolithic granite giants reach for the sky, some exceeding 30 meters in height. Rising from the sun-baked earth, these monolithic needles carved from the living rock are not mere markers of graves, nor are they just tombs. Intricately carved with hieroglyphs and decorated with false doors, they are silent sentinels, each one a testament to the power and glory of a king who dared to reach for the stars. The tallest, the obelisk of Izana, once stood proud at 33 meters, its apex adorned with a golden disc that glinted like a celestial eye, a beacon guiding caravans across the parched plains. The largest, now fallen and known as the Obelisk Park, lies sprawled like a fallen titan, a silent reminder of the kingdom's colossal ambitions. The Obelisk Park adds a dramatic element to the archaeological field. 2. Stele. Scattered across the Axumite landscape stand the Stele, smaller siblings of the obelisks, but equally an impressive construct. The organizational and technological skills of the Aksumites were represented by the construction of stelae. These monuments were created in line with older African traditions and made of single pieces of local granite. They were cut out and transported from quarries located at least four kilometers away, Gabedra Hill, to the location where they needed to be erected. In most cases, the stelae mark elite and royal burial tombs, the largest stelae appear to decorate the graves of the Aksumite kings. The monoliths are spread over multiple terrains, including fields in the northern and southeastern sides of the city, the Gudit Stele Field, and the Central Stele Park. The latter began to emerge as a regional ceremonial and settlement center around 100 AD, and houses the finest manufactured and decorated monoliths of Aksum. The stele dotted the countryside, some depicting battle scenes, hunting trips, and religious symbols, offering valuable insights into Aksumite society and beliefs. The Great Stela, the Stela of Aksum, and Izana's Stela have received great attention due to their height, weight carvings, and significant historical value. They were positioned on the gently sloping ground of the central Staley Park and were to be admired from the downslope part of the then relatively young center of Aksum. This forced the inhabitants and visitors to literally look up to the monuments. 3. Great Enclosure This vast palace complex enclosed by massive walls once housed Aksum's royalty. Within its boundaries lay temples, baths, gardens and residential quarters, hinting at the opulent lifestyle of the elite. Its precise engineering and sheer scale are truly awe-inspiring. 4. Tomb of Izana Carved directly into a hilltop, this elaborate tomb complex showcases Aksumite craftsmanship at its finest. Tunnels and chambers lead to a burial chamber adorned with beautiful plasterwork and murals. Its design blends Egyptian and Indian influences reflecting Aksum's role as a major trade hub. 5. Rock-hewn churches of Lalibela In the heart of Ethiopia, amidst the rugged embrace of the Lasta Mountains, lies a wonder that defies easy description. The rock-hewn churches of Lalibela. These eleven monolithic sanctuaries, carved directly from the living rock, are not merely architectural marvels. They are testaments to the unwavering faith and artistic genius of a bygone era. In a mountainous region in the heart of Ethiopia, some 645 kilometers from Addis Ababa, Eleven medieval monolithic churches were carved out of rock. Their building is attributed to King Lalibela, who set out to construct in the 12th century a new Jerusalem, after Muslim conquests halted Christian pilgrimages to the Holy Land. The churches were not constructed in a traditional way, but rather were hewn from the living rock of monolithic blocks. These blocks were further chiseled out, forming doors, windows, columns, various floors, roofs, etc., 
This gigantic work was further completed with an extensive system of drainage ditches, trenches and ceremonial passages, some with openings to hermit caves and catacombs. All the eleven churches represent a unique artistic achievement in their execution size and the variety and boldness of their form. The King of Lalibela set out to build a symbol of the Holy Land when pilgrimages to it were rendered impossible by the historical situation. In the Church of Beit Golgotha are replicas of the Tomb of Christ and of Adam and the Crib of the Nativity. The Holy City of Lalibela became a substitute for the holy places of Jerusalem and Bethlehem and as such has had considerable influence on Ethiopian Christianity. Their intricate facades, monolithic columns and subterranean passages continue to draw pilgrims and tourists alike, offering a glimpse into the fascinating world of Ethiopian Christianity. Beyond these iconic structures, Aksumite architecture left its mark on everyday life too. Houses were built with a combination of stone and wood, while public buildings and temples often incorporated decorative elements like friezes and geometric patterns. This blend of functionality and beauty is a hallmark of Aksumite design. The city of Aksum grew in population, size, and the complexity of its development, while smaller towns and rural villages sprang up in surrounding areas. The kingdom exercised administrative and economic control over a swath of territory encompassing Tigray and northern Eritrea, the desert, coastal plains to the south and east, and much of the Red Sea coast in present-day Djibouti and Somalia. Aksum also enlarged its territory through warfare. Led by King Azana I, Aksumites conquered the city-state of Meroe, part of present-day Sudan, in the early 4th century CE. In the 6th century, the Aksumite King Caleb sent a force across the Red Sea to subdue the Yemenites, subjugating them as vassals for several decades. The Roman Emperor at Byzantium supported Aksum in this venture, largely in retaliation for Yemen's persecution of Christians. Aksum had become Christianized in the 4th century CE, and became the first sub-Saharan African state to embrace the new Semitic religion. Aksum embraced the orthodox tradition of Christianity, 340 to 356 CE, under the rule of King Izana. The king had been converted by Frumentius, a former Syrian captive who was made bishop of Aksum. He is given the credit for spreading the gospel to Ethiopia. On his return, Frumentius had promptly baptized King Izana, who then declared Aksum a Christian state, followed by the king's active conversion of the Aksumites. By the 6th century, King Caleb was recognized as a Christian by the Emperor Justin I of Byzantium, who ruled from 518 to 527, when he sought Caleb's support in avenging atrocities suffered by fellow Christians in South Arabia. This invasion saw the inclusion of the region into the Aksumite kingdom for the next seven decades. Although Christianity had a profound effect upon Aksum, Judaism also had a substantial impact on the kingdom. A group of people from the region called the Beta Israel have been described as black Jews. Although their scriptures and prayers are in Gez rather than in Hebrew, they adhere to religious beliefs and practices set out in the Pentateuch of the Torah, the religious texts of the Jewish religion. Although often regarded by scholars as not technically Jewish, but instead a pre-Christian Semitic people, their religion shares a common ancestry with modern Judaism. Between 1985 and 1991, almost the whole Beta Israel population of Ethiopia was moved to Israel. The Queen of Sheba and King Solomon are important figures in Ethiopian heritage. Traditional accounts describe their meeting when Sheba, Queen of Aksum, went to Jerusalem, and their son Menelik I formed the Solomonic dynasty from which the rulers of Ethiopia, up to the 1970s, are said to be descended. It has also been claimed that Aksum is the home of the Biblical Ark of the Covenant in which lies the Tablets of Law upon which the Ten Commandments are inscribed. Menelik is believed to have taken it on a visit to Jerusalem to see his father. It is supposed to reside still in the Church of St. Mary in Aksum, though no one is allowed to set eyes on it. Replicas of the Ark, called Talbots, are housed in all of Ethiopia's churches and are carried in procession on special days. The Ethiopian written language, known as Gies, was derived from the Sabaean script that originated in the Arabian kingdom of Saba. Some inscribed stone slabs from the time of Aksum's king Ezana are engraved in three languages, Giz, Sabaean, and Greek. Giz, though no longer the vernacular in the region, remains in use in Ethiopia's Orthodox Church. However, after a second golden age in the early 6th century, sadly, the empire began to decline, eventually ceasing its production of coins in the early 7th century. 
Around the same time, the Aksumite population was forced to go farther inland to the highlands for protection, abandoning Aksum as the capital. Arab writers of the time continued to describe Ethiopia, no longer referred to as Aksum, as an extensive and powerful state, although it had lost control of most of the coast and its tributaries. While land was lost in the north, it was gained in the south, and Ethiopia still attracted Arab merchants. The capital was moved to a new location, currently unknown, though it may have been called Kubar or Jami. There exist different hypotheses as to why the empire collapsed, but historians agree that climate changes must have greatly contributed to the end of Aksum. As international profits from the exchange network declined, Aksum lost its ability to control its own raw material sources, and that network collapsed. The already persistent environmental pressure of a large population to maintain a high level of regional food production had to be intensified. The result was a wave of soil erosion that began on a local scale circa 650 and attained catastrophic proportions after 700. Presumably, complex socio-economic inputs compounded the problem. These are traditionally reflected in declining maintenance, deterioration, and partial abandonment of marginal cropland, shifts to destructive pastoral exploitation, and eventual wholesale and irreversible land degradation. This syndrome was possibly accelerated by an apparent decline in rainfall reliability, beginning in 730 to 760, with the presumed result that an abbreviated modern growing season was re-established during the 9th century. Accounts as to what ended the Great Kingdom of Aksum isn't finished. Local history holds that around 960, a Jewish queen named Yodit, Judith, or Gudit, defeated the empire and burned its churches and literature. While there is evidence of churches being burned and an invasion around this time, her existence has been questioned by some Western authors. Gudit sacked Aksum by destroying churches and buildings, persecuted Christians and committed Christian iconoclasm. Her origin has been debated among scholars. Some argued that she had a Jewish ethnicity or was from a southern region. According to one traditional account, she reigned for 40 years and her dynasty lasted until 1137 AD, when it was overthrown by Maratakla Hamanot, resulting in the inception of the Agal-led Zagwe dynasty. According to an oral tradition, Gudit rose to power after she killed the Beta Israel king and then reigned for 40 years. She brought her Jewish army from Semian Mountains and Lake Tana to orchestrate the pillage against Aksum and its countryside. She was determined to destroy all members of the Aksumite dynasty, palaces, churches and monuments in Tigray. Her notorious deeds are still recounted by peasants inhabiting northern Ethiopia. Large ruins, standing stones and stelae are found in the area. Gudit also killed the last emperor of Aksum, possibly Dil-Na'od, while other accounts say Dil-Na'od went into exile in Shiwa, protected by Christians. He begged assistance from a Nubian Greek ruler, King Moses Georgios, but remained unanswered. She was said to have been succeeded by Dagna Jan, whose throne name was Anbasa Wudem. Her reign was marked by the displacement of the Aksumite population into the south. According to one Ethiopian traditional account, she reigned for 40 years and her dynasty was eventually overthrown by Mara Tekla Hamanot in 1137 AD, who ushered in the formation of the Zagwe dynasty by bearing children with a descendant of the last Aksumite emperor, Dil Naod. It is clear from contemporary sources that a female usurper did indeed rule the country at this time, and that her reign ended sometime before 1003. After a short dark age, the Aksumite Empire was succeeded by the Zagwe dynasty in the 11th or 12th century, most likely around 1137, although limited in size and scope. However, Yekuno Amlak, who killed the last Zagwe king and founded the modern Solomonic dynasty around 1270, traced his ancestry and his right to rule from the last emperor of Aksum Dil Naod. The kingdom's power, however, had eroded entirely by the end of the 8th century. Yet another reason mentioned for its decline was the migration of the nomadic Beja peoples into the area. Their independent herding activities threatened Aksum's territorial dominance. The Aksumites lost their hold on southern Arabia and the Persians subsequently conquered Yemen around 578 CE. The decisive blow was the ascendance of the Arab Muslims, who became the region's dominant power in the 7th century and assumed naval control of the Red Sea. The loss of mercantile revenue undermined the capacity of Aksum's nobility to hold an expanded state together. Political power shifted to a new group of elites, the Agao people, who instituted the Zagwe dynasty based in the city of Lalibela. The city of Aksum remains inhabited in the 21st century. The remnants of the old city were designated a United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, 
World Heritage Site in 1980. The ruins of the ancient city of Aksum are found close to Ethiopia's northern border. They mark the location of the heart of ancient Ethiopia, when the Kingdom of Aksum was the most powerful state between the Eastern Roman Empire and Persia. The massive ruins, dating from between the 1st and the 13th century CE, include monolithic obelisks, giant stelae, royal tombs, and the ruins of ancient castles. Long after its political decline in the 10th century, Ethiopian emperors continued to be crowned in Aksum. It should be mentioned that the end of the Aksumite Empire didn't mean the end of Aksumite culture and traditions. For example, the architecture of the Zagwe dynasty at Lalibela and Yemrahana Krestos Church shows heavy Aksumite influence. In closing, the architectural marvels of Aksum are not mere relics of a bygone era. They are living testaments to human ingenuity, whispers of a civilization that dared to reach for the sky and carve its dreams into the very fabric of the earth. Their stories transcend the boundaries of time, speaking to us of power, faith, and the enduring legacy of human ambition. This brings us to the end of this interesting video segment. Did you learn a thing or two? Share your thoughts with us in the comment section. We are always delighted to pick from them. Also don't forget to support our works by hitting the like button of this video. Share with your families and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening narrative and kindly subscribe to help in building the rising membership of this channel. Every little support goes a long way. Thank you for watching.